Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my pleasure today to welcome you to this Tuesday Scholar event. Our speaker today is Professor John Butler, who will address the topic, Battling Minnesota's Anti-Semites in the Hitler Years. John Butler is the Howard R. Lamar Professor Emeritus of American Studies, History, and Religious Studies at Yale University. He is currently an adjunct research professor at the University of Minnesota, where he earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees. Today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, with the financial support of Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. We are deeply grateful to these organizations. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Professor John Butler, on battling Minnesota's anti-Semites in the Hitler years. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. It's an honor to um, be asked to give a talk like this. Let me explain a little bit about myself and how I came to this subject and why I think it's um, interesting. So uh, I'll just start a long ago. I won't belabor myself. I'm a, I was raised in Minnesota in Hector in Renville County. I went to the U. Uh, I was an undergraduate. I got my graduate degree there. I taught in California and then Illinois and then in Connecticut at Yale, where I was a uh, history professor for 27 years. And I started out as a colonial American historian, studying America before the revolution. And I ended up as a historian of American religion. I don't know quite how that happened or why it happened, but that is what happened. So I've done a number of different things along this line. And uh, when I retired, uh, which was in 2011 and 12, uh, we moved back to Minneapolis where we lived for many summers. And we moved to Prospect Park, uh, which is near the Witch's Hat Water Tower, where many of you will know that. Um, and uh, the very, where we have also three granddaughters. So that's really nice. And our, uh, we have another son in Chicago. It's a shorter plane flight than it is from New Haven. So that's, so here we are. While I was here, after I was here, I was asked to write an essay on religion in um, the Midwest. And at some point, uh, I got interested in a cartoon that was circulated in the 1938 Minnesota gubernatorial election that was uh, had an anti-Semitic character. And I knew, knew that it was at the Historical Society. So when I went to the Historical Society to look for it, I looked in the papers uh, of the um, of the Minnesota Jewish Council, and um, why was there? I found the cartoon, but while I was there, I found these really interesting to me reports of people who who had attended church services at the First Baptist Church in Minneapolis and at the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle on Lake Street, almost. No, one block from the river. It's the area that's that is now, um, the uh, 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 the the uh, Longville Grill. So it's been Cabernet has been demolished, but the Longville Grill is there. And I thought, well, these are really I've never seen anything like this. I didn't know that any kind of an organization would send listeners to uh, congregations that they were worried about for anti-Semitic views. And so I decided to pursue this. And so for the last several years, I've been really sort of poking around at the Historical Society, and then also at uh, the Burman Jewish archives at the University of Minnesota, much of which their materials, many of their materials are digitized, which in COVID days, that makes it a lot easier to work. So, uh, so this is, so I'm gonna give you a kind of partial report. It's a preliminary report on what I found, which I find is interesting, on how it is that uh, Minnesota organizations really combated anti-Semitism in the 1930s and the 1940s especially. We're gonna go up a little bit into the, into the 50s and 60s, not later, um, but I'm gonna talk about the Hitler years as, a, as something. Um, I'm not alone in this. So here's the good thing. The good thing is, is that unlike this subject in many other states, and this is, I don't know why, how and why this is the case, 
that it turned out that the history of Jews in Minnesota and the history of anti-Semitism in Minnesota is well, generally well documented. That is, we have an earlier essay by Hy Berman on anti-Semitism in the 1930s. We have work by Laura Weber and Riv Ellen Prell and Sarah Atwood and Linda Max Schloff, who publish articles in Minnesota history on various aspects, Jews in small towns, discrimination in Minneapolis. There's really, there was really wonderful, wonderful published work. There's also PhD dissertations by Michael Rapp and Herbert Rutman and Linda Max Schloff and Richard Ch Chapman. And uh, they really have um, a lot of detail about various aspects of the history of Jews in 20th century Minnesota, especially in the Twin Cities, and uh, about anti-Semitism. Uh, and then there, of course, there are big national studies. The study, I think it's still regarded as the study, is this book right here. It's called uh, Anti-Semitism in America. It's by Leonard Binnerstein, who sadly died several years ago. Um, and it was published in 1994. So it's almost it's going to be almost 30 years old. So it, it still remains the principal study of anti-Semitism in America. There's a uh, book published in the same year on anti-Semitism in early, relatively early America, the colonial period up through the Civil War um, by uh, Frederick Jaher uh, called Scapegoat in the Wilderness. Uh, but that doesn't concern us now. Um, in addition, to why one of the reasons that I think that uh, all of these people, um, Hi Berman, Laura Weber, River and Trail, et cetera, all these people can do this work is they are fabulous materials here, fabulous documentary materials. The Minnesota Historical Society houses the, the papers of the Jewish uh, Community Religious Council, 68 boxes of material there alone. And the University of Minnesota, Berman's um, Jewish archives have many, many boxes. Uh, they're divided of the same organization, but also of other organizations. Um, and uh, there are hundreds of boxes of material. It's not clear to me, I, I have not done work, say in New York, uh, well, I have, but that's another matter for another book. Uh, I've not done work in other states, Boston, M M uh, Massachusetts, uh, say North Carolina, et cetera, Missouri, California. So it's not clear to me um, what is done here. What's interesting to me about it is that m there isn't, interesting, I'm not sure why, there, there's a lot of work about the content of anti Semitism and the spread of anti Semitism, but there isn't so much work about how it is that local Jewish organizations and their activists really sought to combat anti-Semitism, whether it's in New York City or St. Louis or Los Angeles or San Francisco or Minneapolis and St. Paul for that matter. All of these, all of these local studies do refer to the um, Jewish council uh, that worked in Minneapolis that I'm going to discuss today, uh, but um, they don't really. They don't necessarily go into how their how that is is going to is is proceeded, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on. So I'm going to start with the principal figure involved in this work for many years, whose name was Samuel Shiner, who lived from 1908 to 1977 when he died at age 68. And I'm going to share my screen now. And if I do it right, I'm hoping that Grayson will come along and help me. But we're going to sort of go to here and then click on this. And then we're going to, uh, so there's, there's, there's Mr. Shiner. And again, he lived from 1908 to 1977. Uh, he went, he was raised in Minneapolis, as far as I can figure out. He went to the U of M Law School where he graduated in 1931. He was intriguingly, intriguingly also, he was not only a lawyer, but he happened to be a jazz pianist. And he played for many years, apparently 17 years at the Boulevard Cafe, I think in Minneapolis. Uh, and he also played with popular orchestras. And uh, after the formation of the DFL in the late 1940s, he played at several DFL 
occasions, events, and whatnot. So he was an active DFL member. And he was also a, a jazz pianist. And I don't know whether that has anything to do with anything, except that I find it, except that I find it fascinating. Uh, fascinating. He was um, the leading figure in what first became the Anti-Defamation Council of Minnesota, the Minnesota Anti-Defamation Council, which was formed about 1937 or 38, uh, 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 thereabouts. And then what would become uh, the Minnesota Jewish Council, whose name later changed uh, to, its, to its current name uh, in 1939. Um, he was its executive, he was the executive director of both. And um, he, uh, there were only two, episodes, two intervening periods in which he wasn't there, its director, 1944 to about 1946, after he was drafted and served. Uh, in Asia in the World War II, and then 1951 to 53, I think I might have those dates wrong, when he became the attorney for Minneapolis Hospital, but then there were, uh, it's not clear to me why he went back, but either that position didn't work out very well, or there were some problems with the successor, it's not clear to me which is true. And anyway, he remained the director of the uh, um, Minnesota Jewish Council uh, into the 1970s until he, um, sometime, several years before he died. He was um, really a remarkable person. Uh, if I just tell you that since the Minneapolis Star and the Minneapolis Tribune have been digitized. And this count I'm gonna give you of stories about him in the Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minneapolis papers does not include the St. Paul Pioneer Press, which is only digitized back to 1988 and not beforehand. So it's very difficult to, unless you wanna spend years going through, going through the, through this Pioneer Press, I can't give you, but it'd be in just the Minneapolis Tribune and Star alone, the morning paper, the Tribune, and the evening paper, which was the Star. There are over 150 stories uh, referencing his work from the 1930s into the, 19, into the 1950s. He was really uh, quite remarkable. And he had a lot of, uh, regrettably, he had a lot of um, subjects to discuss because anti-Semitism was very common in the 1940s, a California um, journalist labeled Minneapolis the anti-Semitic capital of America. And it's not clear that that was really the case. Uh, Anti-Semitism was common throughout the United States. And it's really not clear that Minneapolis um, was um, worse than any other uh, major locale. But it certainly was. Um, Anti-Semitism was common here. It is generally thought that, and probably it has some truth, that anti-Semitism was more common in Minneapolis than in St. Paul. And some, some writers uh, really trace that to the fact that St. Paul was itself a minority city. That is, it was a, mi a city of minority, minority in the state, minority Catholics. So, so whereas Minneapolis was a very Scandinavian German uh, city and um, the Catholic presence wasn't so prominent. But Minneapolis did have um, a fair amount, a decent amount, healthy amount, unfortunately, of anti-Semitism. So there was a lot for him to do. Not only that, but there were some well-known figures who really espoused publicly uh, anti-Semitic views. And four of them were associated with Protestant religious groups. And uh, their names are Reverend William Bell Riley, who was at the First Baptist Church for many, for decades. Luke Rader, who was the head and created and founded the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle, again on Lake Street. And then two other lesser well-known persons, um, W.D. Hernstrom, who also worked out of Faribault, Minnesota, and C.O. Stadsklev, S-C-A-D-S-K-L-E-V, who sometimes substituted for Raider at the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle. Each one of them was well known um, for, um, for their, for their anti-Semitic views. Um, again, the, the, what's, what's, what's interesting about this, I think, and I can't, sadly, I can't tell you, is, is this work that, that uh, Shiner, uh, Shiner did here unique? 
Is it typical of what was going on in Chicago or Cincinnati or um, New York City uh, or Boston? Uh, because we don't really have studies of local efforts at combating um, that I'm aware of. And if someone knows of these of any studies, please let me know. Uh, I still use my regular old uh, Yale email address because it's the simplest. It's just J O N dot B U T L E R at Y A L E dot E D U. And you can write to me and tell me, oh, and there's this, you did you didn't know about this, and that would be great. So, so I'm just asking for some help if you have, if you can give it to me. But What's interesting, I think, in, uh, has interested me in this whole subject matter is um, the range and sophistication and the depth of Shiner's efforts and the efforts of his colleagues to combat anti-Semitism in the Twin Cities and in the state of Minnesota, especially. The openness about their work, that is, there was nothing shy about what Shiner was doing. You don't get 150 uh, citations in the Minneapolis Star and the Minneapolis Tribune over th several decades uh, without, if you're, if you're going to be shy or going to do this work under, under cover and just talk to people privately. It was very effort. And some of their work is really quite unique. That is, that is I'm really prepared to say, uh, without that much investigation elsewhere, I'm prepared to say that some of their work is, is probably unique. And the good part about it is it's all documented in the papers for the period that I'm studying, mainly at the Historical Society. There are other materials, some of our materials are going to come from the Berman archives. We're gonna to come to that when we talk about res discrimination at Minnesota resorts at the immediate aftermath of World War II. Those are at the Berman archives. Most of the work that I'm going to talk about here is in the, the papers of the Minnesota Jewish Council at the Historical Society. And those are extensive. And in, you know, Shiner was very good, must have kept the world's, one of the world's really great uh, bureaucratic offices because it appears as though he saved almost everything. And everything is beautifully organized. And so it's, it makes research on this subject uh, easy. There are also so many boxes that take ages for me to go through all of them. So I'm giving you a preliminary report. But one of them, one of the, is a set, are sets of observer reports that started in the 1930s and continued well into the 1950s. That is, people who went to uh, anti Semitic events and then wrote up reports. Schreiner had them write up reports of what they heard, who was there, what kind of talks were given, what kind of an audience was it. These were all, these are all documented in the materials at the Minnesota Historical Society. And they help us discuss popular, what I'm going to call popular anti-Semitism. That is, that is not just the anti-Semitism of these leading figures like uh, William Bill O'Reilly, but of, uh, of some of their congregation members. And we're going to find out more, especially uh, of people at the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle than the First Baptist Church, we're going to find out a lot about how it is, what did, what did Riley say to his congregation and um, what might people have taken away as they left a Sunday service uh, there. So, um, so there are two patterns then. There's a, this very vigorous public advocacy, but there's also this amazing um, discovery effort through observer reports, through uh, written visitor reports submitted to the councils that are all at the Historical Society, through uh, work that he did to uncover uh, uh, discrimination in Minnesota resorts in 1946, 45, 46, and 47. Uh, and then, the, so this is for historians. One of the weird, sort of some weird things that he did, he also, so Schreiner also subscribed had subscriptions to at least 15 fundamentalist newsletters uh, that are all saved in the, in the Minnesota Historical Society papers. And um, they're really, I'll discuss them at the end because it's, it's uh, some of them are the only existing copies uh, because they are just two to four page accounts that are thrown away and they don't make any sense for other people. 
So let's go to the sort of the, the public advocacy. Um, Shiner opened um, his the American uh, Def the uh, Anti Defamation League office in Minneapolis in June of 1938. And he directed the uh, Anti-Defamation Office and the Minnesota Jewish Council from 1938 to 1974, except for these two periods, this draft service and a brief period where he was an attorney for, for the Minnesota hospitals. So let's find out, first of all, let's just, I want to go through some of the um, public efforts that he uh, engaged in across uh, from, 1938 and 39 up to the 19, late 1940s. Just to give you an idea of even in this relatively early period and during World War II before he was drafted, what it is that he was interested in and how it is that he, uh, that he um, worked and what it is that he complained about publicly and made a public issue of. That's, what, that's the important part here. He made public issues of this. Um, his, the first reference in the Star Tribune was to a, to a, uh, a, a legal complaint that he brought, brought against a man named George Blaisdell, who was, who was distributing anti-Semitic literature on Minneapolis street corners in 1938. And he brought a legal complaint to the courts against Blaisdell. Uh, Blaisdell was prosecuted for disorderly conduct and served 30 days in the Minneapolis workhouse for distributing anti-Semitic literature. That's the first reference. Then there are a number of references that he gave about anti-Semitism to, especially to uh, Hadassah and to Benai Breath, men's and women's groups uh, that were frequently cited in the Tribune. In 1940, in the Tribune, he warned against false anti-defamation anti group. Oh, he wrote, he warned against a false anti-defamation group that was soliciting funds in the Twin Cities, but whose, but whose monies were not um, being really being sent to an anti-defamation group. Um, he gave a talk with a man named, a well-known national figure named Edward Clinchy, who was associated with the National Council of Christians and Jews, making the argument that anti-Semitism is wrong and that Jews and Christians uh, come from, this, from a common faith background. It's the beginning of the, Jude, the notion of Judeo, the Judeo-Christian heritage. Clinchy toured the nation and he gave, when he came to Minneapolis, he, he and Shiner both gave talks to this on the same evening, uh, supporting the work of the National Council of Christians and Jews. He became a leading fundraiser for the Minneapolis Federation for Jewish Service. So he engaged in he engaged in promoting Jewish activities there. Uh, in 1942, he protested St. Paul Cafe, which refused to serve Jewish soldiers who were then briefly stationed at Fort Snelling and filed a legal complaint against the owner of the restaurant. And the owner of the restaurant was herself uh, prosecuted for refusing service uh, to, the, to the Jewish soldiers. Uh, in 1942, again, he also warned against false anti-Semitic complaints, that is, against businesses that were, were not engaged in anti-Semitism, but had been falsely accused, as a way of making sure that complaints against businesses were, le were legitimate, so that he could pursue legitimate complaints as opposed to false complaints. In 1943, again, the Tribune reported that he gave a speech uh, supporting the Equal Rights Bill and, and a failed, what turned out to be a failed Equal Rights Bill in the Minnesota legislature. Then in 1943, and intriguingly, he also spoke on race unity at the Baha'i Center in Minneapolis. And here is the first note indication that I have uh, in the Tribune stories that he's interested in racial equality. Um, the word race was used more widely than we use it today. Um, but in, in any case, he did gave this talk at the Baha'i Center. Uh, and uh, the same year, he was then appointed to the Minnesota Interracial Council by Republican Governor Edward Thigh. And there, there he exhibited his interest in, in um, Black discrimination against both Blacks and Jews. 
as well as other racial groups in the Twin Cities. After he was drafted and while he was in military training, he wrote a letter to the Minneapolis Tribune, a long letter, for protesting a Minnesota talk that was to be given by the Reverend Gerald L. K. Smith, who was a well-known American anti-Semite, anti uh, who, who was still arguing against Russia. And uh, even though Russia was our ally, he was concerned about communism and he also was, was still an anti-Semite and was giving anti-Semitic talks in the 1940s. When he returned from after the war was over, he confronted the American Automobile Association on discrimination issues. The American Automobile Association in the 19... 30s and 40s, after it was organized, refused membership to Minnesota Jews. And he made this a public issue. And his council made this a public issue. In 1946, he hosted then uh, Justice Luther Youngdahl at the uh, B'nai B'rith Organization for Veterans, uh, indicating, uh, try, making sure that, that uh, Youngdahl was a well-known, came from a well-known Lutheran family. Uh, was that there was a connection between what what he was um, between between Jews and Protestants and Christians was a, was a, was, a, was a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, he became in 1946 alone the publicity chairman for the I Am an American Day, uh, which pulled together racial religious groups all saying they're all Americans together. This is a way, again, of combating anti-Semitism by demonstrating that the anti-Semitism was, was a false teaching and we're all Americans together. It's important. He, he also, in the, in the, uh, in the Tribune, uh, touted welcome all sticker, stickers for businesses that don't discriminate against minority groups. That is, he. He used stickers which actually came from Los Angeles and um, he bought, bought them and then would give them and promote them for businesses who wanted to make sure that they understood they were open to everyone and didn't discriminate against Jews, against blacks, etc. So welcome all. Um, in 1946, he led a group of synagogues and churches together. Again, notice, notice he putting Jews and Christians together to support the fledgling uh, would-be United Nations. In 1946 alone, the Tribune reported that he gave lectures on intergroup factions, intergroup factors in intergroup tensions at the Minneapolis Council of Christians and Jews. In 1946, he made a splash attacking housing covenants that restricted home sales on religious and racial bases. And some of you will know that there is a there are, for several years now, uh, a, a group of, of people headquarter, now headquartered at the University of Minnesota have been leading an effort to remove racial covenants from Twin City housing deeds. And you can find they, they're found in any number of uh, hundreds, probably thousands of deeds in Minnesota. Uh, well, he was discussing this in 1946. And in 1946, he was honored at a banquet for soothing ethnic and religious tensions after a group of Finnish teenagers in North Minneapolis beat up a group of Jewish boys on Plymouth Avenue. And he uh, actually invited the parents of these boys into his own home. Uh, they talked about uh, the nature uh, about uh, ethnic group tensions, about religion. And then uh, uh, they all came to this banquet uh, at which he was honored. He continued for much this same pace from the 1940s into the next two decades. All the articles in the Tribune, and there are many, many more, what subjects did he discuss from, in, from the late 1940s, and I, I'm stopping specific articles here in 1946, into the 1970s. He discussed fair housing. He wrote about fair employment. He supported anti-bias plaques that could be uh, placed in restaurants and businesses. He supported banning the German conductor Wilhelm Flickwangler and the pianist Walter Gieseking uh, from pl playing and, and uh, supported the effort from denying Flickwangler the conductorship of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra on the grounds that both had significant Nazi ties 
and em embraced them and profited from them during World War II. He defended br the new, brand new Brandeis University, which was organized after World War II, on the grounds that unlike other universities, including still many Ivy League schools, uh, that Brandeis didn't have any quotas, didn't have any quotas for race, Brandeis didn't have any quotas for religion. Uh, we discussed uh, uh, damage, uh, the damage of race prejudice uh, in interpersonal relationships. He began to take up interest in American discrimination against American Indians. He opposed Sunday closing on the ground that Sunday closings violated the separation of church and state. And he supported uh, the controversial Supreme Court decision on ending prayers in schools on the ground of, again, a separation of church and state. That they didn't, they didn't preclude private prayers, but that the schools should not be offering largely Christian prayers uh, in, to their students. Um, so that's, that's the public effort. Now let's look at the detective effort, what I'm going to call the research effort. What is it that, what kind of rep efforts did he lead? Um, they be, these began in 1936 and 37 by a group of men of whom Shiner was one, who were uh, sending or having some observers attend uh, silver shirt rallies, uh, programs with Father uh, Coughlin uh, of the, the notoriously anti-Semitic um, uh, Catholic priest, who was also deeply opposed to the Roosevelt administration. Um, and th these were, there were a variety of these programs. Uh, the German Bund, for example, had lectures in the, twin, in the Twin Cities, some of them very well attended. And a number of these men began to, and these were mostly, as far as I know, uh, this is a, a largely male effort, um, attended these efforts and then wrote reports that they then would give to the new Anti-Defamation Council and, and then to the um, renamed Minnesota Jewish Council. Uh, as early as 1936, at the same time, uh, the, the anti this anti-defamation group, which was, which was uh, in its earliest, very earliest days, sent an undercover agent with the initials SW to the First Baptist Church to check on its association with silver shirt or Nazi supporters. And the observers identified several uh, of, these in, of these individuals who were associated with William Bell Riley's church. They also sent uh, observers, as I said, to Coughlin groups, silver shirt uh, events, uh, organizations of the, of the German Bund. Then in 1938 and 39, Shiner's group began regularly to send observers to the First Baptist Church and to the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle. So let's discuss why would they again pick, pick William Bell Riley's church? The truth is, is that uh, they picked it because William Bell Ryler, wa Riley was a major Baptist figure uh, who was had been very active in the in the promotion of American fundamentalism among Protestants, and then um, and then um, uh, because he was head of the Northwestern Bible Seminary Bible and Missionary Seminary in Minneapolis, which is now the University of Northwestern in Roseville. Okay. Um, and it used to be located in just off downtown Minneapolis. He was a major figure and he was the head of that. And um, there is happens to be a book called God's Empire. It's a biography of, of, of uh, William Bell Riley by William Vance Trollinger Jr. It's really a first rate biography. It's actually, a, and it has an entire chapter on the subject we're, I'm about to discuss, which is William Bell Riley's anti-Semitism. So Trollinger has already discussed and uh, reported on William Bell Riley's anti-Semitism. Uh, so the question is, well, was he falsely accused and whatnot? Um, no, he wasn't. He had already, he published in 1934, a, a book entitled Protocols and Communism. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion was, was a notorious tract 
uh, created by anti-Semites in Russia in the late in the 1890s that espouse relationships between an effort between Jews to take over world commerce, commerce uh, in the name of, of, of Jewish banking industries, particularly linked to the Rothschilds, for example, and, um, and to um, uh, discriminate against, against Christians. And he, he made the argument that the that Jews uh, were also deeply involved in communism. And uh, he published a book, this book called um, Linked Jews and Communism um, Together. He also gave a, uh, a uh, sermon. Uh, ah, I forgot several slides. Well, this is Mr. Riley, this is a good picture. And this is First Baptist Church, which you'll see is, an, is a major institution. The building is still there. It's now renamed. It is, is no longer called the First Baptist Church. It's now, a, if I may say, I don't mean this in a demeaning way, it's now a born again uh, congregation. And you get some notion of, of, of Riley's um, impossible influence by this picture, which was taken after the sanctuary was remodeled in 1924, of, of the number of the several thousand people who could be seated during some of his Sunday sermons. And this one happens to be more than full. Okay. And you can also see here how it is an observer, a man or a woman, could easily uh, come to a service and essentially listen, sit there undetected and then leave and write up a report about their attendance. In 1930, whoops, uh, in 1936, he gave a sermon called The Jew and Communism. And this here, this is the typescript. And uh, um, Riley had a secretary type out many, many of his sermons. And a number of them, not all of them by any means, are at the University of Northwestern. And some of them have been digitized. And this happens to be one was given on the 18th of October in 1936. The date is right up here. Uh, uh, if I can, you know, if I can get my laser pointer going here, let's see if we can do it. The date is right up here in the corner. You can see that. And the title of the sermon is The Jew and Communism. Um, he makes the argument in this, in this sermon that he's been discussing both communism and and Jews. And then he's going to say in the next page, I don't have a, a, a slide of, of the next page, he's going to say uh, that he's not anti-Semitic, but he's going to make the following argument that Jews have only to blame themselves for their reputation of being communists, that Jews, because Jews reject the Bible in the public schools, because Jews support evolution, the theory of evolution, and ridicule critics of evolution, of whom, of whom Riley was a leading figure and had in the 1920s and early 30s sought to ban the teaching of evolution in Minnesota schools, that Jews were, quote, always present at communist rallies and meetings, and that, Jew, quote, Jewish secret organizations, which he doesn't name, uh, support communism. So some of the things that I'm going to say here are sort of are insulting, and I'm warning you um, that that I'm simply trying simply trying to convey to you sort of the depth of of Riley's anti-Semitism and what 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 kind of issues he's raising. Uh, he also raised religious issues. I don't have a a um, I don't have a, a digitized copy of a sermon that he gave as late as May 1940, in which he discussed uh, the Jews and Jews and Jesus. And then he made the following argument. And this is the old argument about Jews as what it's called the Christ killer argument. That is, Jews were the killers of Christ. And what did he say? And this is what the observer took down. And this is an a quote from the report of the observer. There is absolutely no, this is what this is what uh, Riley said. The, the observer tried to transcribe exactly what Riley said. There is absolutely no doubt of the fact that the Jews crucified Christ. They did it with their hands and their lips. They stood there and cried out, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" Now, um, 
that Riley was an anti-Semite is, I think, indisputably true. And what what uh, what Shiner and his colleagues were doing was to confront Riley. They actually wrote letters to him in the 1930s. Uh, Louis Louis Schwartz, there's a letter in the, in the papers of the Historical Society in 1935. 1934, protesting the publication of his book, Protocols and Communists. And then he wrote again in uh, several months, several weeks later, and then wrote again in 1937. And Riley responded to these letters frequently by simply denying that he was an anti-Semite, but that as he, he would put it, why, why are Jews at these rallies? Why are Jews, why are some Jews communists? That was always his response. And that all the, all the Jews bear responsibility for those who happen to be associated with communism. That was Riley's typical response. Um, these reports largely largely end by 19, the late, 19, late 1940 for several reasons. One is uh, very simply that Riley seems, and Trollinger documents this, Riley seems abruptly to have himself stopped discussing Jews in any sermons from roughly late 1940 until his until his death, and that is into during the World War II period, he simply stopped doing that. It was a uh, Trollinger, his biographer, really says it's is is a is a uh, uh, a political stance on his part. And secondly, Riley stepped down as minister sometime in 1942, and his health he was already in his 80s. And his health wasn't good. He died in 1947. That didn't stop the congregation, however, from uh, having some anti-Semitic talks. And there was one report in the in the Historical Society papers um, that really um, suggests that at least some anti-Semitic uh, talks were being given. And that involves a, a 1942 uh, talk uh, given given by a figure who two years later will write a book called The Red Terror and Bible Prophecy. His name was Dan Gilbert, and he gave a talk in April 1942 on Hollywood. Now, um, Riley had already discussed uh, the relationship between Jews, communism, and Hollywood in his books, and apparently in some of his sermons. So um, the, 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 the person who took notes didn't specifically say that that Mr. Gilbert discussed Jews, but he did discuss Hollywood, the foreign elements in Hollywood, that Hollywood is steep, steeped in sin, it's steeped in communism, that it is antichrist, and it's run by people who are anti-Christian and anti-American, and that uh, uh, members of the First Baptist Congregation should know this. So, so there was a relationship between still some anti-Semitic talking going on in First Baptist Church in the 1940s. Um, the, the, um, the First Baptist Church reports aren't always terribly interesting because some sometimes some weeks observers would go and Riley or Riley didn't say anything about Jews and his sermons were boring and they didn't have much to report. The reports coming from made of the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle from the late 1930s into the late 1940s uh, suggest uh, quite something else. Uh, the Cap Tabernacle was founded by a man named Luke Rader, who came from a Protestant minis ministering family. His father was a minister, his brother was a minister in Chicago. Um, he lived from 1890 to 1952. And he founded the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle. And so we'll go now. Here's Mr. Rader, uh, about a photo from about 1939. And this is what the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle looked like around 19, I believe around 1940, uh, thereabouts. And again, this is where this now has been demolished, and this is where uh, uh, the Longfellow Grill and the set of apartments and whatnot are now located. On this, on this property. Uh, the um, American Jewish World newspaper, which happened to be published in the Twin Cities, was on to Luke Rader as early as 1932 and did a whole front page story 
about Rader's anti-Semitism in 1932. Uh, the Observer reports for um, the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle are usually more expensive, more expensive and voluminous than the First Baptist Church reports. And they also contain interesting comments on the generally low theological level of the services, that is the crudeness of the services and the crudeness of the anti-Semitism espoused by both Rader and the audience. And I, what I'm going to do now is go to a 19, I'm going to choose a report that's late. It's late, it happens to be, uh, have come after Shiner himself returned from military service and uh, again returned to his headship of the Minnesota Jewish Council. Uh, but reports, these reports continue through the 1940s. Um, and uh, uh, they, I've chosen the report for 1946 for several reasons. I think you'll see why. Um, before several, for, for a number of reasons. Um, and it happens to come a full two years after all Americans were familiar with the liberation of uh, Auschwitz, Dachau, et cetera, and the horrendous uh, Holocaust that the German, German Nazis had, um, had undertaken to eliminate Jews from Germany and Europe. So it isn't as though the uh, Americans were ignorant about this. They were they were more than uh, more than well informed about about it, and um, there um, uh, and for that reason, this particular event is um, the report is particularly interesting. So um, so you notice here's the date right here, October 6, nineteen forty six. Um, what's interesting is that, uh, to me, is that there were only there were about 50 people present, which would be typical for a service, uh, from judging by the reports, um, that other reports. 75% were women over 50 years of age, in other words, a rather older audience, and only 25% men who were also over 50 years of age. In other, in other words, most people were above 50. And... Uh, most of them were Swedish and Norwegian by a show of their hands. Now, what's interesting is I'm not quite sure how, how did the hands get shown. Uh, Rader must have asked individuals about their background or whatnot. And so the report, and you see, we're going to go back and forth here. It's two pages long. There's the second page. We'll come to that in a minute. We'll go back to the first page here. So here's the highlights of Rader's talk. Um, so the first comment is about uh, is about race, in which Rader de de denies uh, this. This has to do with blacks. By pure logic, there are no two species of people. Rader stressed that by saying this, God created man in His own image. He further asserted that this is a highly controversial question, where many people from the South would disagree. So he's actually going to disagree on the question of separate racial origins for whites and blacks. Okay, so we have that. So this, this indicates some of the peculiarities of, of the intellectual milieu in which a figure like Rader could also be an anti-Semitic person. Now he's, now he's going to carp. He's going to say he's got a question with many people in this city in St. Paul as to whether we are giving anti-Semitic speeches. To that, he said, apparently Jews are in great concern. So they, notice that they is in quotation marks, are not allowing me to put my advertisements as I please. So then he says, it's either the Jews in the legislature or the Jews who own all the newspapers and radios who brought pressure on him. So he, now he's got it, you see, he's got a complaint against Jewish power in the, twin, in the Twin Cities. There are Jews in the legislature, there are Jews that own the newspapers, which of course happened not to be true. Um, there are Jews who are powerful here, and they're oppressing his comments on the Jews. Uh, now he's going to say, but further on this subject, Jews are such a small minority, yet they have so much power. And here, notice what he's going to do. He's going to do the familiar trope of asking these leading questions. Why is that? How is it that Jews have all this power? Uh, he asked. Jews aren't, then, then, he, then he apparently said, Jews aren't fit to live. They should be wiped away from the earth. And the observer wrote, 
These are exact quotations. Now again, please remember that this is 1946, two years after uh, the liberation of, of, of the uh, Nazi concentration camps. And these are the kinds of, of, um, of, of sentiments that are being expressed by, by Luke Rader at the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle. He's continuing on. He said, the people who question miracles are unbelievers. Who are the unbelievers? Who are the people who don't believe in Christ? Uh, it's a throwback to the persecution that Paul the Apostle suffered. Okay? He had almost everyone crying on this subject, of which he elaborated on the terrible abuse Paul suffered because he believed in Christ. Oh, and here he uses the name Paul Rader. He really meant Luke Rader. Right? If only the unbelievers would believe in him, there would be no trouble. So in other words, the Jews should, should convert to Christianity. If they convert to Christianity, they wouldn't have any trouble. Now we come to uh, even more interesting comments. Um, and again, I warn you um, that the comments I'm going to read, I've been upset about the comments I've already read. Um, I do warn you that the comments that are coming are really unpleasant um, and um, obnoxious and um, um, I think it's important that you that readers that listeners understand the the nature that sort of ethno what what historians would call the ethnographic nature of setting for anti-Semitic notions. Comments overheard in discussion groups. Jews are rats, and that she that is comment who made an elderly woman of maybe 65 to 70 years old, would not be as easy and gentle on them as Luke and Paul were. She can never trust them and hopes to be able to say this, even if she's jailed for speaking like this. And then uh, someone else said, Jews believe they are in stabler ground if they become Masons. And that's why they join Masons. In other words, there are Jews who are secreting themselves into uh, other largely Christian or popular uh, Protestant organizations the, that's, that's really not what the Masons were, but that's how they're often in, in group. This, of course, gives them a chance to get into highly restricted places where they've always wanted to be. Then there's laughter. Laugh, laugh. They've always been scapegoats for the fruits of fault, faults of the world, and that's laughing uh, uh, by that moment. And then um, as Paul Rader said, but he means Luke Rader. Of course they are, history of Bible tells me that. And the, now, now we go to Palestine. President Truman was so wrong to act the British to let the Jews in Palestine where they have no business. They will only cause a war if they go in. Jews are so ignorant as to demand that this is not rightfully where. Now we come to conspiracy theories on the death of Roosevelt. Again, I'm, I'm trying to show you how these reports are valuable purely for the ethnographic information they give us about the, about the congregation at the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle and what it is that people believed. On the death of Roosevelt, they firmly decided that he was shot by someone using a silencer on the gun. In other words, Roosevelt was murdered. Why should the only people with him be a communist artist and no doctor, okay? They said that his casket was probably cemented and will be guarded by the poor ignorant Jews who think he's so great. Of course, he was the worst president of all because he liked the Jews, which shows they are no good too. The people who said this were married, wealthy, and highly technical. So the commentator, the observer, is making a comment here. So people who said this were married, wealthy, and highly technical. When the food was being served, one person, uh, one, one, person said, asked, is she like ham? And the woman replied, no. And the other one said, are you a Jew? And she answered emphatically, no. And please don't speak her name in that connection with Jews. She simply couldn't stand them and didn't care what they ate. And then, then there's a final comment. Jews are by, by people at the, um, at the uh, uh, service. Jews are sometimes going to become less and less popular with people if they continue to persist on entering Palestine. There are enough hot water today, et cetera. So um, what's important here is really is the context that we're, we're, we're getting um, ethnographic information from these observer reports about the popular, the character of what we call popular anti-Semitism. 
some of this isn't really new, um, but um, it's important to know to see this um, uh, in, in, in this work done by all the people associated with the Minnesota Jewish Council. Now we, we can come to the end here. Um, in 1946, as soon as um, Shiner came back from the arms of, he launched a campaign to figure out what Minnesota resorts were discriminating against Jews. And um, these materials happened to be in the Berman archives at the University of Minnesota. And what he did was ask, um, especially in, in the Duluth, uh, people associated with, with the with, um, Jewish community group in Duluth, to go to hotels and look at the re resort brochures that um, were easily often distributed in, in hotel lobbies and find um, and find um, resort that that indicated they have a problem. And what he did was he found he, here here this is an example of the Gitche Gumi Lodge in Lutzen, Minnesota. I don't know if it's related to here we are, Lutzen, Minnesota. I don't know if it's related to the resort now called Lutzen. That's not clear to me what the, I don't know the history, the background of the Lutzen Resort. But you'll see right here, restricted clientele. And this turns out not to be unique. So um, here we go. Uh, he compiled a list of 32 resorts and typed them up. This happens to be page two. And you'll see them. The Basswood Fishing Lodge in Ely, selected clientele. Birchwood, Lake Vermilion, restricted clientele. Bovi, uh, Rit, uh, Bittner's Resort in Bovi, Minnesota, selected clientele. Uh, the Burns in Cass Lake, Minnesota, Gentiles only. The Canadian Border Lodge in Ely, selected clientele. And you can see the, the, uh, all of these all of these listed. Then down here, Rutgers Bay Lodge. Um, this is the predecessor of the current Rutgers Resort. Clientele carefully restricted. So what do we, what, what response? What happened was that then um, Shiner or others acting, acting for the, either the, Jew, the Jewish group, the uh, community group in Duluth or um, the Minnesota Jew Jewish Council in the Twin Cities would write to the resort and confront them on these and to ask them to take away these statements. Uh, and what was the response? The response was all private as not public. Um, the response was varied. Uh, the Arrowhead Resort in Ely denied that restricted meant religion and claimed to have several Jewish clients. The Grandview Lodge in Brainerd said they do not restrict Jewish people entirely. They take three to six Jewish families, but they only take new Jewish families if they're recommended by the, those that they already take. They also take no grandfathers and no babies. Um, some resorts admitted discrimination. The Burns Resort in Cass Lake wrote back and said, yes, we, we take only Gentiles. And the Glenmar Lodge in Longville, Minnesota also uh, acknowledged that they only took um, uh, Gentiles. In each case, Shiner or others would write back to them and cite the 1943 Minnesota statute that prohibited race discrimination on ra based on race, religion, color, or national origin and that they reported these resorts to the Minnesota Tourist Bureau, which in turn would write to them to ask them to take these state to stop discriminating and take these statements out of their brochures. Um, what's most unusual, um, and I don't have a slide for this, is the last item I'm going to discuss, is you know, uh, Schreiner's subscriptions to fundamentalist newsletters. Uh, he subscribed to roughly 15 of them. He subscribed to the Bible News Flashes, the Defender, uh, the Gentile News, Gospel Track Tidings, the Green Mountaineer, the Hookah Treat, the Intelligence Digest, 
the Onamia Journal, Our Common Cause, Sunshine News, that was the newsletter published by Paul Rader, Social Justice, which was the newsletter published by Father Charles Coughlin, and The Wanderer, which was a conservative Catholic um, uh, newsletter. Um, exactly what he did with these subscriptions isn't entirely clear, but uh, well, all we can say is that he kept them, and <clears throat> they are all carefully kept in boxes at the Minnesota Historical Society. There are, there are really piles of them, sometimes 30, 20, 30, 40 copies of these over, over the years. And they run from the 1930s into the, 19, into the 1950s. Um, presumably, he read them, someone read them, and would note any anti-Semitic comments. Though other than that, we don't know. And the only thing I can say is that as a, someone who studies American religion, I can tell you that uh, most of them have only two or three copies known, and some of them at the Minnesota Historical Society are the only known copies. So it becomes the, the Jewish community papers at the Minnesota Historical, they become a, a, an, uh, a, a, a lodging place for the history of, Minis of Minnesota and American fundamentalism. So what does this all tell us? I think it tells us something of these efforts to combat anti-Semitism. One is they tell us how complicated the actual expression of anti-Semitism was and is, how varied it was, how it how it popped up in so many different aspects of Minnesota life, uh, from resorts to restaurants uh, to jobs uh, to housing uh, to public expressions, how much it was embedded in other sentiments. Consider the sentiments of just in that one report from 1946, two years after the liberation of, of the, the Jewish concentration camps in Germany and Eastern Europe, how vicious and um, detailed and vigorous these anti-Semitic comments about Jews were two years after the liberation of Dachau. And how religion is either the center or the reinforcement mechanism. Is, anti, is this kind of anti-Semitism anti cultural in character? As a primary character with a justification from, from, from certain aspects largely of Protestantism and Christianity? Or does it flow from the notion of Christ killers and rejecting conversion and then infect other aspects of American life? These are questions, of course, that the historians of anti-Semitism discuss frequently, uh, endlessly, uh, and to great profit. That's not what I'm discussing here. Here, I'm really just trying to open up the subject of expression of anti-Semitism in Minnesota and the efforts of one person to um, uh, combat, and many people, associated with the Minnesota Jewish Council to combat anti-Semitism in the state. So that's my, not, that's my presentation. And uh, good that my voice is giving out a little bit. Uh, so I think it's time for Judy to come back on the screen and for uh, me to stop my screen share, if I can do that here. So there we okay. go. Okay, well done. Okay. All right. Well, we have a number of questions in the Q&A line, and I will uh, read them. I, I also noticed that, that there were more than a number of, uh, than a, the usual number of comments that had strayed into the chat line. Uh, and I would ask you, please, could you put them in the Q&A line so that I can uh, ask them or read them in the order, you know, in order. So we, uh, yeah, so please uh not in the chat line, put your comments and questions in the Q&A line. Um, the first couple of questions, I think in a way um, that maybe you covered them a bit later in the talk, but if you want to add anything to this, uh, the first couple of questions just asked for examples of how religious leaders uh, 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 spread anti-Semitism. Uh, I think you did cover that, but maybe only about halfway through the talk, but is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, I think, um, let, let, let's, let's um, 
uh, discuss this in two ways. One is important to note um, that by citing the cases of uh, William Bell Riley and uh, Luke Rader or Mr. Herstrom or Mr. Stads Club, I don't mean to indict all Christian ministers. Um, there were Christian ministers in the Twin Cities who opposed anti-Semitism. And of course, there were well-known efforts to oppose anti-Semitism. For example, the, the um, theologian, the neo-Orthodox theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, was a very strong uh, opponent of anti-Semitism and the kind of anti-Semitism that was prevalent in America in the 1930s. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the, the, the Catholic writer Jacques Maritain uh, was also a vigorous um, uh, opponent of anti-Semitism within, within Catholicism. The difficulty is that for people like Riley, who was a fundamentalist Baptist, uh, Niebuhr wasn't nearly orthodox enough for him, though so he wouldn't have been interested in what Niebuhr had to say. And of course, he had a kind of residual anti uh, and vigorous anti-Catholicism, so we wouldn't be interested in what Jacques Maritain had to say on yeah. these subjects. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a, a kind of a big divide here among um, uh, Christian ministers who uh, harbored anti-Semitic anti -Semitic views, those who directly espoused them, and their listeners. And the, the, the hard question is, we don't know, for example, what did most, let's say most Protestant ministers, most Catholic priests, we don't know what most of them how most of them sermonized. We don't know how, how most of them felt. And it's going to be impossible to determine that. And we never will know because we don't have the materials. Uh, we, we, we really lack the, lack the materials. But um, I think it's fair to say that a figure like, uh, figures like Riley, especially, with notice that great big congregation and all those people there, can have a very powerful effect on hundreds, thousands of people. And Riley's effect was even more so because he really was the, was the uh, uh, Eminence Grise of the Minnesota Baptist Association. And because he headed the Northwestern Theological School, he was really the minister who, who ordained enormous numbers of Baptist ministers throughout the upper Midwest, not just in Minnesota, but throughout the Dakotas, Wisconsin, and Iowa. And so they, they all had, had a kind of connection to him. And the question is, to what extent did they tout what it is that he said? A figure like um, Rader has a more limited um, uh, purview. He's, he's not influential in other, necessarily in other Protestant circles. It isn't quite clear how influential he was in the evangelical circles. And um, his influence is really some pamphleteering that he did, um, uh, which is hard to come by, uh, rare because the pamphlets are little tiny things that you can hold in your hand, and they're they are very difficult to come by, so it's hard to hard, hard to find them. Um, and um, he didn't write so much. He, he, he wasn't really uh, a writer, whereas um, uh, Riley was. Riley also wrote uh, another uh, grossly anti-Semitic tract called Wanted a World Leader that, he that was so bad that he had to publish it himself in 1940. Um, and there are only five or six known copies of that, um, several of them here in Minnesota. Um, and I haven't seen that. I know from Trollinger's biography, I'm taking it from his biography that it's virulently anti-Semitic, but I have not myself seen it. So I'm, but I will take Trollinger and his word because it's a first rate historian. So there we go. I'm gonna skip ahead uh, because it, it's so relevant. You were just talking about the, the Northwestern Bible Institute, which I think you said became Northwestern College. Uh, which is currently located in the northern suburbs. And that was also the college this questioner asks uh, that was associated with Billy Graham. That's correct. Uh, is that true? And, it and, is true. And it, what were, was, was Billy Graham anti-Semitic? What was Billy Graham's so that, that, uh, you, public pronouncements on the subject? That's a, that is a complicated question. 
So Graham became the president of the Northwestern Bible and Missionary Training Institute when mm -hmm. Riley died. But I believe he had already resigned. Riley died in 1947, and I think, I'm not sure of the date when, when Graham resigned, but he was only the president for a couple of years. Um, there is no known expression of anti-Semitic comments that I know of on Graham's part in the 1940s. That said, you might remember and uh, that when the Nixon tapes were released, someone found tapes of a visit that Graham had with President Nixon when President Nixon was in office and that Graham seconded anti-Semitic comments that Nixon made. And, and then when these became public, uh, profusely apologized for them. Um, uh -huh. so, so that's a fact. What happens before that, uh, from the time that he was became briefly the president of the Northwestern Bible Training and Missionary Institute, to that incident with Richard Nixon. As far as I know, um, and there are some, any number of biographies of superbly researched biographies of, of Billy Graham, um, uh, I'm not aware that he expressed vigorous anti or any anti Semitic. I stand to be corrected about that. Maybe there's something somewhere, but it's not a prominent feature of his ministry. So that. that now, uh... that's, my mm -hmm. answer, my it's, it's a qualified answer to the to the okay. really sharp question that has been asked. But now let's turn to another uh, famous uh, figure from that era. Uh, Hubert Humphrey uh, was a very, very well known progressive. He was the mayor of Minneapolis, I believe, in the 1940s. Right. Um, what role, if any, did he play in uh, minimizing or combating anti-Semitism? So I think it's uh, so Humphrey played a very prominent role during his mayorship of Minneapolis and um, during in his career in the U.S. Senate. But maybe our interest should be when he was mayor of Minneapolis. Um, and that is he supported fair housing legislation. He supported mm -hmm. fair employment legislation. He opposed anti-Semitism. He opposed discrimination against blacks. He opposed discrimination of most any kind. And he was a vigorous liberal and was vi vigorously criticized for that by, by any number of conservatives uh, who argued usually on the, on the grounds of property rights. In other words, mm -hmm. that on, on housing, for example, I shouldn't have to, I should only have to represent, I should only have to rent or sell for that matter to people that I like. And if I don't like them, I shouldn't have to uh, sell them. And, and that doesn't make me an anti-Semite. That doesn't make me, I just don't, you know, that's how, that's how um, these, the, their question was largely argued in the 1940s. Humphrey opposed all of that. And he just said, look, if you're, if you're advertising something for rent, it's for rent for everybody. Uh, whoever wants to rent, that's, that's their background, their color, their race, their religion, that, 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 that doesn't count. And um, the, same with employment. If you're advertising a job, the job should be available to anyone, uh, no matter their race, their religion, uh, their color, their, their national background. Uh, so, he, so Humphrey was a, was a very strong supporter of what we, would now call, what we would call civil rights and we're called civil rights then. Civil rights means rights for everyone, rights for those who belong to the civic, Rights for the law, law, who are members of our public, and that's what civil rights mean. There are rights for that are available to every person who is here in this, lives here in this society. And Humphrey was very, very supportive of that. And um, Shiner himself, Shiner himself, uh, was was it turned out a DFL, or not surprising, uh, as were many Jewish leaders of the period. And um, we're clearly supportive of, of DFL and democratic politics. In this 
next uh, is really more of a comment than a question, but perhaps you would like to comment on the comment. Um, this person says in the late 40s and early 1950s, a sales rep from Berg Bags of Minneapolis, which still exists, the sales rep sold bags for vegetables to my dad's business, Nolan Brothers of Hayward, Minnesota. The sales rep was Jewish and was unable to get a hotel room in Albert Lee, but stayed at a family-owned motel near Hayward when he called on my relatives. Uh, they had a truck farm in Hayward and bought bags for their potatoes, onions, and cabbage. Um, so would you want to comment on that? Was that a common experience? Um, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> uh, that kind of discrimination was was perhaps more pronounced against uh, blacks for the for perfectly obvious yeah. reasons, uh, racial yeah. reasons, the color of one's skin. Yeah, uh, it was yeah. it was it was, um, it was common in Minnesota. It was if it was less pronounced against Jews in Minnesota, it was for uh, that was true for two reasons. One is is that uh, is that there wasn't a racial dimension. You might not know who it is that wants a room. Uh, if you were really a, a, a vigorous anti-Semite, you might judge by the, by the surname, by the surname that you would guess were, 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 uh, uh, were Jewish names. So that Bledstein, for example, someone who, whose name is Bledstein, would, might you know, create a reaction, say, we can't rent to you, I'm sorry. It's clear that this is the case in these resort uh, uh, configurations. Um, that resorts are saying restricted clientele, and the restrictions have to do with both race and religion, generally. Um, they, they may also have applied to Asians um, and, um, and others, but it would be the large restrictions were race and religion. So what the comment commentator, what the commentator is saying was indeed uh, 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 commonplace. And of course, Blacks were in a tougher position because um, they, you know, how many Blacks lived in Albert Lee, um, if that's the town, if I remember correctly, uh, in, in 1948, let's say. Um, my guess is that not many. Um, and the uh, question is, where would the person go? Um, maybe they would go to the next hotel and hope they weren't discriminated against. But it was it was a, it was a it was real. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't fake. And and you know, Sh Sh Schreiner was really interested in particular um, in uh, in in this question because he felt uh, strongly that Jewish soldiers coming back from World War II should have the right to vacation anywhere they wanted. And that this, that his, I think his sense of that was, had been exaggerated by his own service in World War II. That these men uh, had, had sacrificed a lot. Some of them had been wounded uh, or they came for, or families whose sons had whose sons and some daughters, some daughters had been killed in the war or maimed in the war had the right to vacation where they wanted to vacation, and they shouldn't be discriminated against. And so that was his his that was his in a sense his immediate motivation for launching this um, campaign to figure out what resorts were discriminating against Jews and what could be done about. It. Okay. Uh, we now have more questions in the Q&A line than we did when we started, which is great, shows people are really involved. We only have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to apologize to those whose questions I don't get to. They're all great questions. We'll just keep pushing through and see how many we can get. Um, here's a comment. The view of the River Lake Tabernacle and its billboard was what the class of 1956 St. Paul Central High School saw from its favorite drive-in, the flat top. Dr. Butler must be aware, as I was not, says the writer, that there were two Paul Raiders prominent in the fundamentalist Christian community. Is that true? It is true. There was a, there was a brother um, an older brother who was prominent in Chicago, 
-hmm. And uh, Luke Rayner's son was also named Paul. Mm -hmm. It's actually okay. possible that the person I was quoting from is the son, but mm -hmm. it, it's awfully early in the son's um, um, career. Yeah. So I still think it's a mistake um, and that the person being quoted is Luke Rayner. Okay. Yes, um, I'm aware you... of, of that. And it's, it's um, I've forgotten if the father also was named, uh, Luke Rader's father was also named Paul, but I'm not, I'm not sure of that. But his okay. brother in Chicago, um, who was also uh, a more, uh, uh, I think a less pronounced anti-Semite, was well known in Chicago revival circles and evangelical circles. But he was, he was older. Um, mm -hmm. uh, than Luke Rader. Do you know when the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle was demolished? Ask this question. Um, I don't. I think uh, I really I I don't uh, know when it was demolished. It was demolished. I, I here's what I do know. <laughs> it, it, it's easily you could one can figure it out. Uh, after when it was after it was demolished, a proposal was made that a plaque be put up, be installed on the exterior of the building of the apartment complex and building that now houses apartments and the Long Fellow mm -hmm. Grill, which which I don't believe the Long Fellow Grill owns the building, but in any case, mm -hmm. whoever the developer was, that a plaque be put up to commemorate the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle, and Minnesota. Uh, University of Minnesota history professor Hyman Berman led a vigorous effort with Minneapolis council members to oppose putting up a plaque for the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle exactly on the grounds that this had been the site of vigorous anti-Semitism for decades and that the, mm -hmm. that the River Lake Gospel Tabernacle did not deserve the kind of recognition that would be granted by the plaque, which of course would say nothing about mm -hmm. anti-Semitism. Okay, so I'm I, gonna ask the go next ahead. two uh, in, in tandem, basically. The first one is a comment. In the 1970s, my Jewish children were accused by classmates of being Christ killers. That's in the 1970s. And then the question, which comes from another uh, viewer is, which of these anti-Semitic uh, remarks, conspiracies, are currently expressed in Minnesota. So 1970s to now, well, that's 50 years, but how how long or are these still uh, ideas still alive today? The, uh, the notion of, of Christ killer will come up. It comes up in novels, um, okay. in, in older novels, usually. Um, it was the common phrase used uh, uh, to um, taunt Jewish kids in grade schools, junior highs, you know, middle schools and high schools. It was, it was very common. Well, well, as the, your, the example is given at the end of the 1970s. Um, you know, I'm a historian uh, and um, I, I can't, I do not know the degree to which the phrase is still relatively common in anti-Semitic mm -hmm circles today that that is something that i i can't i'm not saying it's not i simply don't know that and i wouldn't want to say uh that it, that it is uh, i i can't what was the second the, the quest question you that was asked well the the first question was the comment about right. uh, children being called and the second question was are these uh, anti-semitic uh, tropes, comments, uh, conspiracies, theories still being expressed today. Some of the some of the anti-Semitic, it's called the rise of anti-Semitism. You know, um, in the last ten, in the last decade, um, so that's all connected to a whole variety of conspiracy theories. Some of which are have have resonances of the kind of language that that I quoted from. Uh, from the from the 1940s, and some some of which don't. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this also is not my area of expertise. And um, I know there are sociologists and whatnot who would be better better able to answer your that question than I am. Except to note note that the kind of anti-Semitism we have today is 
is a, notice one thing, it, it's a, a lot of it is, is fatal. That is, we have all these shootings and whatnot. Um, this is, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's entirely new, but it, it is, it, it, the question is, what is it connected to? What do, the, what do the murderers believe? How do they, where do they get their ideas from? Um, yeah. And that's a whole area of, of scholarship and inquiry that deserves a, a lot of attention because it is, it is, it is really extremely destructive in our own, in our own society. Do you know if uh, Mr. Schreiner, was it Schreiner or Shiner? It's Schreiner, S S Schreiner, S yeah. Schreiner. Yes. Was Mr. Schreiner ever the subject of violence in his support of uh, the Jewish community and his opposition to unfair practices? I do not. I don't have any record of him as someone who was subject, who experienced violence in his own, in his own time. Um, mm -hmm. He was, he experienced violence during his relatively brief, but um, profoundly interesting uh, time in the U.S. Army because he was, he was, he was stationed in Okinawa before, before it was, when there was still fighting there. And he reported on shrapnel coming through his tent, uh, which was reported in a comment in the Minneapolis Tribune. But I'm not aware that he was ever subject to violence. Okay. Is it true that Jewish physicians could not obtain admission rights to local hospitals and therefore built Mount Sinai Hospital? The answer to that Minneapolis? question is yes. Okay. All right, yeah. we're going to leave it there because we got two minutes here. We want to get in a couple more if we can. Uh, you haven't mentioned in this context Minnesota's own hero, Charles Lindbergh. No, <laughs> I haven't. Uh, Lindbergh, of course, uh, was himself. Um, harbored deeply anti-Semitic feelings that he expressed here and there. He also um, was all but a pro-Nazi. Um, and there is a new biography of Lindbergh by Chris Gers, G-E-H-R-Z, who is a historian at Bethel College in St. Paul. And it's a first-rate biography of Lindbergh's religious life which is interesting in and of itself um, and interesting about, about Lindbergh. Um, so um, I, didn't, I didn't mention him uh, in part because my talk is really about efforts to, to oppose anti-Semitism and whatnot. And um, I, I, ironically, I, I didn't find much uh, about Schreiner and Lindbergh. So I didn't, actually, I didn't find anything, I will say that. Um, but plenty of other people were talking about Lindbergh, and he—he, he, he, I suppose you, one could say he didn't need to add his voice to the many comments uh, made, made opposing Lindbergh's views before, during, and after World War II. I'm so sorry, we're just about out of time. I do want to note that several people uh, in the audience wrote in to say that the uh, the tabernacle, the River Lake Tabernacle, was raised in uh, September 2002. Um, so we will leave it at there, although I uh, there are so many excellent questions still in the Q&A line. I wish we had time to get to them all. Thank you so much, Professor John Butler. Thank you, Grayson and Carmi in the background. Thank you to the audience who came up with such excellent questions. I hope to see all of you next week when we will welcome um, John Roman, Dr. John Roman from the research organization NORC, N-O-R-C, at the University of Chicago. He will be speaking on the topic gun control. Why is it so hard to accomplish? But today, for today, we're going to say thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.